Hello, I'm Nikki Pistorius, profiler, author and psychologist. I'm privileged today to introduce you to my colleague, former Superintendent Franz van der Kerk of the South African Police Service. Franz, almost 30 years ago, on the evening of the 17th of September 1995, you received a fatal call informing you about a body on a field close to a prison. Now, at that stage, you were already a very experienced detective, but I don't think anything could have prepared you for the carnage that you found on that day. Tell us about that scene. Well, uh, at that stage, I was on standby and we got called out to a murder, which was quite standard. Uh, we went out during the night and we got there, we started processing the scene, and then once the sun started coming up and it started becoming a light, we then made a very, very, very gruesome discovery. And that was most probably one of the worst experiences of my life. What did you discover? Well, we discovered Initially, we discovered nine female bodies in different phases of decomposition. Um, it was very clear that they actually found their demise through extreme violence. And uh, at first sight, it appeared as if they had been raped and then they had been strangled to death. Um. As the chief investigator, how would you, where would you start processing that crime scene? Well, you see, the most important thing in any murder case uh, is the fact that the crime scene is first and foremost the place where you would find the majority of your leads and your evidence. So a crime scene is of is enormous importance to any investigator, especially when you're dealing with either it be any form of violent crime or either it being some contact crime. So how did you start? There you are. What well, did, what went through your head? First and foremost, is there is a vast amount of challenges that actually goes about with this. Um, we started off by cordoning off the area. It was in a felt. It was not in an urban area. Uh, we then had to get a, a proper perimeter set up uh, in that specific area so that once the sun came up that we could start looking for any type of clues that would help us and also then is to start gathering all the necessary evidence that we could use at a future stage in a court of law. And, and I suppose now people are arriving at the crime scene. How does the word well, spread? You see, it's, it's actually exceptionally challenging to work on a crime scene of that magnitude. First and foremost, you're there, the couple of, of you that comes out. Um, then your colleague starts arriving because it's a major case. So fortunately, I've been blessed that I had the opportunity to work with some of the best professionals, most probably in the world. And they all kicked into gear, started participating, so they all had to be briefed. Then we had to start looking for additional clues, for additional evidence, uh, trying to find and see if the perpetrator was not perhaps just still in the specific area. So you bring in the forensic experts, the crime scene unit, they start with the crime scene. You've got a detective that copiously makes notes of everything because you're working now towards a court of law. So you have to ensure that your integrity of everything is well documented. Everything is kept as sterile as possible. Then we started bringing in the dogs um, in that specific case. So you start leveraging off not only your own expertise and your own knowledge and experiences, but also 
start tapping into other professionals and then their abilities. I specifically remember arriving at that crime scene early in the morning as well, and I was overwhelmed by the slaughter and you know and, and just moving from the one body to the other and observing the different ligatures that he used. You know, and, and but I was looking at you as well and I thought you're so professional and so in control of this absolute chaos. You see, I'm fortunate I had a very good and professional team. Uh, no serial killer case, no big crime scene is ever an individual effort, unlike what the movies portray. Uh, you've got a lot of professional people, they all kick into a, a higher gear, they all participate, everybody listens, everybody assists, and everybody starts giving a helping hand on that specific thing. I remember when you came to the crime scene, at that stage also is, is we had relationships that was forged before that crime scene, and based on those relationships, uh, prior to that, I, w- I visited Vinyl in Pretoria and East Team. So I was very familiar with the modus operandi. I was very familiar of what the Atreachville crime scenes was. And therefore, I then actually identified the literature. It looked the same. And based on my observation and based on my knowledge, I then contacted the Atreachville team and the Cleveland team to come and assist to see how much of similarities there was within the modus operandi. Being able to make that link at such an early stage, I think gave us a phenomenal advantage. Where if if we worked in isolation, we never, well I wouldn't say never, but we never would have been able to do to solve the case in mm-hmm. such a time as matter as what we did. Also, on that day, I, I remember um, helicopters, you know, arriving. Who were in the helicopters and how did oh. that help or not help? Well, you see, working on a crime scene of that magnitude is exceptionally challenging. First and foremost is you have to take your own personal feelings, your own emotions and set that aside completely because you're dealing with carnage, there's no other word. You are staring into the result of absolute pure evil. That's what I call the abyss. Yes, well that is the abyss. Uh, I I remember prior to that reading Elisla's first book, Whoever Finds Monsters. Um, So when you have that, then you've got all the officers coming, your commanding officers, they have to be briefed. Then the generals started t- trickling in. First the local generals, then as as the word spread about the amount of corpses, um, we had the National Commission of Police flying in. And it wasn't a very pleasant experience because they were telling us from the helicopter that there were actually additional corpses which we didn't know about. So the body count kept on rising. Um, Secondly, after that, you then have the politicians. Uh, You've got the news media that's trying to snuffle out some form of a front page story, so you've got to keep them at bay. Then you've just got like that vast amount of police presence and sirens and everything that then draws automatically a crowd of people driving past and everybody starts stopping because it was next to the main road. So you've got onlookers that you've got to contend with. So, and then furthermore, is, is, is you've got to then actually keep a finger on the pulse as to what's happening on your actual crime scene as well. And I remember even the President Nelson Mandela arrived, which of course took the president. Yes, well the President, he was the President at that time. President Mandela did arrive there. Um, he actually asked me to give him a briefing. Uh, we went, I uh, took him through the crime scene at that stage. Fortunately, that was more or less about midday. So most of the castings have been done of what was on the ground and everything. So 
I took him through through the actual crime scene. He didn't say much, um, and wished us luck. And then he left. Interestingly enough, after the court case was finalised, he invited us all to his house for mm-hmm. lunch. And on that specific day, he came to me and he says to me, "I was an apology." And I was very taken aback as to what was what's he talking about. He says to me. I'm a lawyer by trade, and that specific day I thought you wouldn't solve this case, but I do owe you an apology for that, which was uh, something I think coming from Nelson Mandela. coming from Nelson Mandela to me and all the street cop. It was I respected him a lot for being so truthful and so honest. How did you eventually solve the case? We actually, you see, at that stage, you break up into different teams because you've got different teams. When you work on a serial killer case, it consumes your entire life completely and utterly. You do not have a personal life. You sleep anything between three, maximum four hours a day. The rest of the time you're working because there is a a tremendous amount of responsibility on it. Um, in in the uh, in my opinion, the serial killer views it as a game. He makes a mistake, you're gonna arrest him. You don't you don't arrest him. You make a mistake, he's gonna leave your body. So you start to start feeling very responsible for every person that dies, because the people are dying because you haven't been able to fulfill your duties, and you push yourself much faster. At that stage, while we were still busy, uh, a former colleague of mine, Leon Nell, started taking statements, started gathering information. Um, We found a woman at a school that was approached where the one victim was from. And she was approached by a man that offered her a job. And she got the name Moses. And... Fortunately for her, the day that he was supposed to come and take her for the specific job, she was off sick. And he then took her friend, and that was the one that passed away. So then we've identified Moses. And from there onwards, we started working. We went back, vinyl, and then went back into their records. Eventually, we saw that there was a Moses that also was a family member of one of the suspects that they had interrogated previously. And then we just started working. We identified him as Moses Tolle, and then the hunt was on. I remember that that he's we published the profile, and and at some time his brother-in-law called and said, "You think well, this is the Moses?" Yeah. Well, his his brother-in-law actually his brother-in-law was we identified him and we found out that that Moses from Pretoria had a brother-in-law in in Benoni, in Actonville. And we approached the brother-in-law and he said, yes, Moses is around. And he was eventually the person that uh, Moses approached to find a firearm. And the brother-in-law assisted us then in setting up the sting operation there in which we arrested Moses. And he was shot? Yes, he was shot. He, he actually to wielded an axe to, to, to one of my colleagues. He got shot in the leg. And then from there onwards, we took him to hospital. I still remember it quite vividly. It was raining. It was cold and miserable. And from there onwards, then the process followed. Just, just a question as a detective, which had the greatest satisfaction, arresting him or the final conviction? I would say the arrest. The reason why the conviction to me was not the pinnacle of it is because once you've arrested him, and we were very sure because at that stage we had another individual that actually came and confessed in Victoria and he was just uh, trying to seek fame and stardom. Um, 
is the fact that once you've arrested that person, you know that the killing is going to stop. Yes. Yes. Whereas once you go through a court of law, it's a process, you know what's coming, yes. you know what's to be expected, yes. and it just final, finalizes the matter. Yes. But I would say the most important thing always is arresting the right suspect and knowing that you are actually now saving lives. I think there we have it from, from a very experienced detective, that feeling that now the killing is going to stop. Yes. And it did, in that case. In that case it did. Soon afterwards there was another serial killer again, but... <laughs> that's for another interview. That's, no, but what I'm saying is, <laughs> yes. that's the way it goes. That's you know? the way it goes. You know, there's no definite finalization in stopping killing. We wish I could. Yeah, I wish I too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for, Thank you for having me.